Welcome. This is a small claims court intro to filing basically a plaintiff's claim across Canada. Now, uh, it's not called plaintiff's claim in all jurisdictions of Ontario. In British Columbia, for example, here on their website, you click on the forms and you can see um, where is it? It's notice of claim. Form number one here. Oh, I just went by it. Yep, notice of claim. So this is what it's called in British Columbia. Essentially, I'm going to go through province by province and give you an overview. I'm not going to cover all the provinces, but you're going to get the idea once I do six provinces. So this is what the claim looks like when you download it from the uh, British Columbia, Government of British Columbia's website. <clears throat> it's giving you some instructions here, step by step, how to fill this out. And here is the actual claim itself. Now, up here is where your name is going to go, your address, province, postal code, telephone number. You'll see on the right-hand side there, it says claimant. And on the right-hand side below that, it says defendant. The defendant's information. If there are other defendants and other plaintiffs, you can do that. Uh, down here, you can see uh, it says, if you need more space to describe what happened, attach another page. That's under the what happened section. And essentially, I recommend always putting a Schedule A in that section. So C Schedule A attached is what you're going to put in this form here. And you're going to attach Schedule A. I'm going to go over what, the, what that claim should look like. There's a uh, time limit all the time for a defendant to reply. In, in uh, British Columbia here, it's 14 days. In Ontario, it's 20 days. There's different timelines and rules across Canada. Consult with those rules. There are different, you know, procedures and processes and uh, applicable uh, things that you can and can't do in small claims court. I'm only going to address a small, minute amount of those in this video. This is all to do about one thing and one thing only getting the plaintiff up and running, how to start the small claims action across Canada. So all of this form has to be filled out. You can see how much you are asking for. Uh, and then you have several different copies here. This says the defendant's copy. This is the copy that you serve. <clears throat> so it's your service copy. <clears throat> and uh, your certificate of service. This is going to be what you fill out after you've served the, the plaintiff's form or after you've su uh, served your lawsuit. You're going to put that I certified that I served this plaintiff's claim or the, yeah, the statement of claim or the uh, claim uh, with whatever else documents you serve them with. And you're going to check off how you did that. Um, ultimately, you know, this is a very basic overview, but there are rules as to when you need to file this and um, how these are filed. Uh, so consult with your courthouse if you need to know what's going on. Uh, ultimately, though, you're going to find all the rules online. What to fill in here? Well, I can't tell you that. You have to decide what to fill in here specifically. I'm going to give you a sample at the end of this video as to what to fill in, as far as the particulars go. Now I'm searching in Alberta, typing in Google, Alberta Small Claims, and here we are. Now, <clears throat> uh, I'm recording the audio portion of this video after I have completed the uh, screenshot video here. And I know that I'm going to click on this link here, civil claim, and it's not going to come up as being readable by my PDF viewer. The 
the version of Adobe that I have installed on this particular um, on this particular system here is not up to date with what they uh, what they have set up in Alberta there. And obviously there are some instructions that come up, but the claim itself is fillable online on the Alberta uh, government of Alberta's website here. So uh, what I recommend doing is updating your updating your Adobe software. I don't I don't do that in this video. I, I thought it was going to be too tedious to do that. Uh, so I just continued on with the other provinces. Uh, but ultimately, you know, your most up-to-date uh, PDF software or Adobe software is going to be able to fill this out. This also could be because I'm on a Mac. Uh, I know that uh, there are some distinguishing uh, elements between different um, PDF programs that are embedded into the uh, web browsers. And I know that on a Windows machine that, uh, you know, that can easily be accomplished. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm not doing that on this video, but I will assume that you have the most up-to-date software. If you're, if you're living in Alberta, definitely go and uh, make sure your Adobe software is up-to-date. On to Saskatchewan here. You can sue up to $30,000 compared to $50,000 in Alberta. And <clears throat> so there's uh, some basic, basic information here. And Saskatchewan has uh, a really cool feature here down uh, all these uh, links here, accounts receivable, it says banking loans. You'll see <clears throat> they give you a sample, a sample claim on what your claim should look like. So here is that claim right here. So it basically gives you, you know, everything filled out already. And it gives you a sample as to, you know, uh, who's making the claim. The plaintiff, a snow removal company, is a company incorporated in Saskatchewan. You know, this should be your first paragraph is what they're suggesting. This really resembles a statement of claim in, uh, in Ontario, my jurisdiction. Um, to the extent that, you know, obviously there's, uh, the headings are a little bit different, but the paragraphs numbered like this with the information as it's laid out, this is how you want to put that schedule A. This is an example of what should go in your schedule A when you're attaching it. If you live in a province that has, uh, the form that allows you to attach different documents, or uh, additional documents, do it and make sure you have control of what that of what that document looks like. And what I recommend at the top of the page is having S Schedule A, Statement of Plaintiff's Claim, if you're in if you're in uh, British Columbia, as we saw earlier, with the little checkbox that says I'm attaching extra extra pages. Now this is a good you know, first paragraph should look like this, describing who the plaintiff is. Paragraph two should describe who the defendant is and where they reside. Again, this is all basic, basic information. This is recommendations. This is a sample by the uh, Saskatchewan government. Plaintiff's claim is against the defendant for the sum of the amount of money. And it's over essentially a 50 inch TV. Purchase was made. Uh, the check was returned saying insufficient funds. The bank charged an extra fee. The plaintiff has demanded the money but hasn't received it. The, plaint the uh, defendant still has the DV, hasn't returned the DV. So this is basic, basic information that should go in a claim in small claims court. And uh, these are all samples that anybody can access across the country found on the Saskatchewan government's website, Saskatchewan Court's website. And again, they have so many different templates to use as far as the different language uh, for suggestions, but you have to really fill in this information by yourself. Uh, you guide your file. If you're a self-represented litigant, we can't tell you what to put here. We can make a suggestion like this, 
we can tell you that, you know, that uh, we can point you towards a sample, but we can't tell you the particulars as to what to fill in here. That's up to you. You have to decide that. <clears throat> um, so essentially what you're looking for in these types of statements are basic point form, uh, simple, you know, non-legalese type language you're using, basic, basic information that needs to tell your story. This is how I was wronged. This is what needs to go in these different respective paragraphs. And it needs, it should be laid out chronologically speaking from the furthest event away to the most recent event. And, and in Saskatchewan here in particular, they list the claim amount at the end. Now that's not necessary. And I would suggest that you could claim that in the first paragraph and it would still be fine. And in most, and in most provinces, you're going to see that the claim as far as the monetary amount that you're claiming is usually in the first paragraph. But that's Saskatchewan. They're just giving you a sample. Here's Manitoba and what they look like. Uh, as far as their court website right here, I typed in Manitoba small claims. Um, you know, you have a whole bunch of great information here on Manitoba's website. You can sue for up to $10,000. <clears> this is something good to note. A claim uh, may include general damages up to $2,000. In, uh, I think it's Nova Scotia coming up in a little bit. You'll see general damages can only be claimed up to $100. Uh, in Ontario, I believe there's no limit. You can claim $25,000 in general damages if you wanted. Uh, general damages are basically damages that the court will assess um, and uh, that aren't necessarily tied to any monetary loss, but they could be. And uh, so any specific damages, uh, specific out-of-court uh, money that you've lost are usually called special, special damages. And general damages are different in that, you know, they can cover pain and suffering, for example. And pain and suffering, you know, how can you quantify that? You can't. And uh, general damages, obviously, in Manitoba here are limited to $2,000. Even though the claim as a whole can be up to $10,000, uh, you, you have to limit yourself uh, to $2,000 claim for general damages in uh, Manitoba. So this is a different heading at the top here. This is obviously the uh, small claims form for the plaintiff. And uh, what we have here is, again, samples of headings. Uh, these are just samples. Again, the claim is going to look like those numbered paragraphs. The bulk of the claim is going to look like those numbered paragraphs. And you're going to fill in that portion. Uh, any requirements that you think are missing, it's best to consult with your local court office. Go into your blue pages in the phone book or go and search for your local courthouse on the internet, on, on Google, start searching, you know, uh, Manitoba or, or um, you know, Winnipeg, Manitoba, small claims court, and it will pop up some addresses. Give them a uh, uh, give them phone call, and you know go down to the courthouse and talk to them in person. Develop a relationship with those clerks at the courthouse because they can be your friend. Although don't mistake them to be your friend. Uh, if they're friendly, they aren't there to give you legal advice. They can give you basic legal information, same as us. Um, we do it in a different way, though, and this basic legal information is quite expanded in its form in the style that we can give you. And, uh, and when you're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with us, it's something that um, 
it's something that we can get very specific on issues if you are requesting that from us. And um, it's, it's really good to note that uh, what they can do for you at the courthouse is, is be very general in nature as far as uh, the information that they can give you. They can tell you about rules and, you know, where to find uh, information pertaining to, <clears throat> uh, pertaining to service or what have you. They'll point you into that direction. You know, they probably won't sit and look at it with you uh, and explain detail by detail what something means in the rules, but we can do that. We can do that on the phone, by video, Skype, you name it, and we can do it at your leisure, outside of regular business hours, which is a great thing, I think. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is, you know, become familiar with those people at the courthouse and, uh, and you know, don't overburden them. Uh, they can be very helpful. Uh, they can be very helpful if you develop a relationship with a with a clerk there you know it can be a very cordial um, relationship that you have on an ongoing basis and you'll you'll see them on a regular basis uh, Manitoba here this is a great link you could find on Manitoba's courts websites website um, you know self-represented litigant information that is tailored to you know Manitoba Although some of this is applicable and general information that will be applicable all across the country. And it's up to you to decide whether or not information, legal information, really is suited to your case. So I'm having a little bit of an issue finding the form section on Manitoba's website here. And I'm now typing in a different set of keywords and now that brings me to the form section. Now I know in particular that the small claims form is found at rule or form 76A and that's just from you know having uh, already done this but uh, essentially this is what it's going to look like. Your file number is going to go up here. You're not going to put that in there yet. The clerk is going to give you that file number once you are uh, once you are ready to be issuing your serve, your uh, file, um, Queen Bench Center under there, you're having you know the name of the city, and then you have the name of the claimant and the defendants. You're gonna t uh, click off the type of claim here. Uh, you're typically going to have only one type of claim. Uh, although you may have, you know, an NSF check fee or a contract fee. Reasons for claim and details. Always, always, always attach a separate document. And in that section right there, reasons for claim and details, put C Schedule A, C Schedule A attached. And then create another document in Word and call it Schedule A, your claim. Uh, and then you're going to customize that paragraph by paragraph, just like, you know, just the, just like the examples that we've seen already. Not being biased or anything, but uh, Ontario Court Forms, I think, has the easiest uh, set of uh, procedure uh, rules laid out and uh, easiest, visually speaking, across the country. Uh, as far as the different forms go and uh, the different guides, you see your claim number will go up there. You're going to put the, uh, the courthouse that you're at, the address and the phone number of that courthouse, and then you get into your details. Obviously, you're going to fill out all of this information. If you have a representative, you know, they are going to be filling this out. You shouldn't be taking a look at this. Uh, again, what happened? Where? When? You're going to only put here C Schedule A attached. That's it. That's all you got to do. And then you have to create a nice, sharply written Schedule A document. 
and that should look like what we've already taken a look at, and that is chronological paragraphs, uh, sequentially numbered. Don't forget to put this here. This is the most one of the most important things to put on this form here. How much are you claiming? The limit in Ontario is 25 grand. You're going to click that box. Additional pages are attached because more room was needed. You're just going to attach extra pages because you want to detail out your claim how you want to detail it out and not put it into the form that the government gives you. The plaintiff also claims prejudgment interest from blank. Uh, that is a specific date. So that usually is the date of the damages and when they arise from. And um, so that can be pursuant to the Courts of Justice Act or an agreement that you make between the parties. And uh, that rate, you know, is, uh, is a variable rate underneath the Courts of Justice Act. There's a regulation that sets out, uh, you know, what the different interest rates are dating back to, you know, so many months or whatever. And it's all... It, it that gets updated um, I think on a yearly basis I'm not sure but uh, yeah uh, here is the most interesting I guess of the small claims um, websites across the country we have uh, Quebec's small claims website <clears throat> um, now you completely fill out everything on the Quebec website. Um, I didn't look intensively for it, but the actual forms to fill out by hand, I don't know that you can get that on here. Um, but what I can say is that it was really easy to navigate through their small claims form, uh, you know, program that they have on their website here. So, um, you know, to access that, you have to sign up for this specific website. And this is all part of the government website. You just basically have to put your email address and, uh, you know, email address and fill out some really basic information. I'm going to create that account now and uh, skip through some of those steps. But essentially, it's a really easy process. You just have to verify your email address on uh in your email account once you have everything set up. That's, uh, and now, here I am. I am uh, now a member of the Quebec website to fill out a small claims form. You can claim up to 15 grand. And a good note, you cannot have a lawyer represent you in small claims court in Quebec. Another, another just interesting point about the, uh, about the legal system differences across the country you know, you can have lawyers across the country except for, uh, except for in small claims court in uh, Quebec. So I'm filling out this, you know, and this is basically going to draft out. So I'm basically clicking all these boxes here. And essentially, all I'm doing is, you know, filling out the specific informations. Uh, so, you know, John Doe, and, you know, if your business, if you have a business name, you know, ABC Company Incorporated or whatever, and the address, you know, all of these particulars, I don't need to go through this one by one across each province. But what you need to get a handle on is drafting out that Schedule A. And I'm going to do that here in Quebec. I'm also going to do it on, a, on, a, on, a, on another form in uh, an eastern province, I think Nova Scotia, I, I fill out the uh, Schedule A portion. And what's very important to know is that your pleadings are everything, absolutely everything. Your case will live and die by your pleadings. If your pleadings are completed in a deficient way, or if you have you know, um, if, if you describe the events improperly and it's unclear as to what you're actually claiming, it is very 
likely that the other side can bring a motion to dismiss your claim because your your claim doesn't disclose a reasonable cause of action or a likely cause of action that gives rise to damages. Um, so what I will encourage you to do is practice, 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 practice. And uh, it's coming up here where I'm going to lay out a sample of, of uh, the of the cause of action. It, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea. So, uh, oh, so here's the description of the damage observed. Um, <clears throat> and I think I started filling out this section, and then I realized I was in air, and I was uh, typing in these details in in the wrong box here. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is in regard with regard to damage observed. Um, I believe I copy and paste this into the box below. So right off the bat, I'm already filling it out wrong. What did I already tell you? Paragraph one should describe who the who the plaintiff is. And I rectify that because I realize it after reviewing my work. And you should always be reviewing your work and um, you should always be reviewing your work and looking to try and make things uh, uh, easier to read and simpler. And essentially, you know, the, um, you know, the pleadings or the claim is going to be set out in a way that best describes it for the person who is making the decision about your case. I think uh, here's the point where I, um, yeah, I, I haven't, uh, So I'm going into describing the damages. I think that's, um, but what you'll see at the end is it's, it's going to put together the document for you uh, in the in the proper form. <clears throat> so. You know, what I encourage you to do is uh, review this video, review the language that I'm using too. The defendant intentionally and or negligently released his grip on the dog's leash and the dog came up to the plaintiff and ate a chunk of the plaintiff's hand. Simple, very simple. As a result, of the injury uh, as a result of the injury okay I'm gonna delete that here the plaintiff's hand bled immediately you, you'll see you know I'm making this scenario up in my head as I'm going along I didn't plan this out what whatsoever but essentially you'll you're getting the story in very basic form, you know, right in the first three paragraphs. Although what we're missing, obviously, is uh, first paragraph about the plaintiff, second paragraph about the plaintiff if there's a, if a, there's a co-plaintiff, and uh, and so on. The next paragraph after all the plaintiffs are listed is about the defendant or the defendants. Um, so now we're getting into the you know the story of the of the injury and how they those injuries were sustained. The plaintiff was taken to Montreal General Hospital. Instead of just saying the plaintiff was taken to the hospital, list the actual hospital, Montreal General Hospital, and treated by Dr. Big. If you know that information, if you don't know that information, it's fine. You'll be able to find out at some point later on in the future, hopefully, or you can go and talk to the people at the hospital 
and see who if you can get your hands on the records at the hospital. There will probably be a fee for, for doing that, but if you were taken to the hospital, you're going to want those records anyways, especially if you're going to sue somebody. So make sure you have all these details. Um, you know, you can get in paragraph four there, you can get as specific as the plaintiff arrived at 444 p.m. or whatever, and that will be listed on the report. So you take the information from the report, and then that becomes part of your claim. That becomes of that's become that becomes part of the allegations that you make and the set of facts that you uh, set out in your claim. And the claim is essentially your version of the facts. What you don't want to do here is you don't want to plead evidence. You don't plead evidence in you don't uh, plead evidence in pleadings in your statement of claim, your defense, uh, unless it's you know extremely relevant. Unless it's like a text message or a quote from somebody from a. a, a from something that you're relying on. That is the crux of your argument. If it's that important, include it. Otherwise, leave evidence out of your pleadings. Pleadings should not have evidence included in it. And what I mean by evidence is anything or document that supports your claim. Your claim is essentially allegations. You will at a later point substantiate those allegations with your evidence. And here is the point. Here is the point. A judge has to, you know, at an early stage, if the other side were to um, bring a motion to dismiss because they believe that you don't present a, a reasonable cause of action, Essentially, what that's saying is that at the face of it, reading your document, if all your allegations are true, does that amount to uh, something that you can claim damage against? And if it doesn't, then you have a problem. Your, your action's probably not going anywhere. Um, but you're going to want to review this video. Review the specific paragraphs uh, in here. Essentially what these specific paragraphs are doing by telling the facts and making allegations is that uh, what, you're, what you're getting in a nutshell is, um, oh, I think here's the point where I go back up to the first paragraph. Yep. And I'm now going to put in, I'm rectifying my mistake here. So my mistake was obviously, as I spoke about it earlier. The plaintiff is a person who resides in uh, Quebec. You know, you can put an adult person, you can put, you know, something specific to identify this person, a person of disability residing in Quebec. The defendant is a resident of Montreal, uh, Quebec, and the owner of the dog. Name mentioned urine. So obviously now I'm going to mention a dog, and the uh, and the claim is about a dog bite. That's essentially what this claim is about. You know, somebody's walking through the park, and then they uh, and then the defendant, you know, makes uh, you know negligently essentially is what the claim is about. Uh, the defendant negligently. Uh, release the dog from its leash. And if you don't know what the elements are of negligence now, now you have to go and look at what the elements of negligence are, and now your story has to fit what the elements of negligence are. So, for instance, uh, negligence, uh, so you have to have two parties. Uh, one party has to suffer damages. Uh, one, the defendant has to have, um, you know, reasonable foresight that their action, uh, this is just an example. I'm not, I'm not giving you verbatim what the elements of negligence are, but you'll be able to find this by Googling, uh, negligence tort Canada. 
and you'll find out what the elements of negligence are that the defendant had to ha have reasonable foresight essentially to you know if they let go of their dog leash it's reasonable to assume that the dog would go and run away it's reasonable to assume you know there has to be uh, an error on part of the defendant and you have to clearly lay that out here in these pleadings so i encourage you Maybe even turn down the volume here and read these paragraphs, paragraph by paragraph, and read what the claim is actually about. The um, then uh, uh, then you'll get an idea of what to put in your claim. I hope. So. Um, <clears throat> I continue on here. Uh, this is the actual damages that I have been suffering. Um, you know, I've been suffering emotional damage. I've been attending at a, I've been attending at a therapist's office, uh, describing the emotional trauma I've been suffering. All that has to be detailed out in the claim. Um, <clears throat> the reasons why the defendant is liable. The defendant is is liable because uh, the defendant is vicariously liable for the actions of the dog <clears throat> by the dog bite pursuant to uh, I know in Ontario they have this type of act but it's like a um, you know dog dog uh, dog bite Dog Bite Owners Act, I call it. It's not actually an act. Um, but if there will be some authority that you should rely on here, this is the section uh, where, you know, the court is asking you where the authority is that this person uh, is liable to you. They could be liable to you in common law. And in common law, you know, in tort, that's you know, where you can um, get somebody liable for some kind of wrong done to you. But there could be an act of some sort, the Dog Bite Owners Act or the, you know, Dog Owners Act, or um, <clears throat> I'll just uh, do a quick search. I think there's a, uh, so there's a, in Ontario, there's a Dog Owners Liability Act. So that is statute authority, you know, that is legislative authority for you to get a claim. So now you're going to have to go within that act because there is an act. You're going to have to go into that act and figure out if there's actually a claim. There could be some, you know, exclusion. Um, there could be uh, some exception that's made so if it happens and you know it may be that negligence is used instead of the dog owners liability act for instance um you know there's there there is always um information that is helpful when you're noting up and when you're noting up essentially you're basically telling um, you're, you're basically, you know, starting at one point and then you're finding all the other branches of applicable law, uh, available to you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so continue watching this. I'm going to just briefly, uh, so section 5.1 under the dog and this is on in ontario of the dog owners liability act section 5.1 says that uh the dog the owner of a dog shall exercise reason reasonable precautions to prevent it from biting or attacking a person or domestic animal or behaving in a manner that poses a menace to the safety or uh, of persons or domestic animals. 
So that therein is a duty now imposed on a, an owner of a dog. And if that owner has breached that duty, well, therein lies some of where makes the claim stronger. And it may not rely necessarily on negligence now, it will rely on this act uh, or the act that, you know, pertains to, you know, whatever your claim is about. You know, there could be, your, your claim could be about a fire. Um, and, you know, there's a fire prevention act. So you're going to want to do all this research before you get to the stage that is present on screen. This is filling out the form. This is ready to file. Now, this is not, I have to go out and do my research now stage. This is, I'm ready to file. I'm within the statute of time limitations. And I know that I have a claim because the, you know, the dog owner's liability act says so. And, and now, you know, this is the final document that was pumped out of the Quebec website. And it looks very similar, paragraph by paragraph. Everything's numbered sequentially in, uh, in order. Uh, there's a couple errors here as far as, you know, the numbering of things. But that's my fault because I didn't know what to expect with the, uh, with the formatting of the actual form. But, you know, you're going to have to play around with it. And now you print that off. You serve it, or you go to the courthouse and get the um, get the clerk to put a file number on it, pay a fee, and then it's ready to serve. Uh, let's move on to New Brunswick. Yes, small claims court, New Brunswick. <clears throat> I think this was the province that only allows. I'm almost positive it, that uh, New Brunswick was the province that only allows a hundred dollars in up to a hundred dollars in general. Uh, maybe it's not. Anyway, f uh, in general damages is what my thought was. Again, uh, you can do this in French or English. Uh, and, you know, you're going to fill out who the parties are, what their details are. You need to know where to serve somebody. You need to know somebody's last known address to try and serve them. It has to be put in on this form here. Again, additional pages are necessary. You're going to want to fill out all of this stuff and then tick that little box. Additional pages are necessary because more room is needed. That is necessary. Uh, so claims up to 12, uh, 12,500 in New Brunswick. And claim amount. So you can claim, you can say that somebody damaged you in a higher amount than 12. 12.5, but essentially you're going to abandon that part of the claim. Um, here we have, uh, you know, how we are going to proceed at the hearing, the address of the court, and, and these are some instructions to the defendant and response within 30 days it's kind of an average number in ontario it's 20 in bc it's 15. so that is uh, new brunswick and again the most important thing you're going to do is put c schedule a attached or c attached schedule a and then you're going to create a separate document with those paragraph numbers uh, laid out. Oh, here it is. Nova Scotia has uh, damage, general damages no greater than $100, <laughs> which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, it is completely out of line and uh, not in line with what the rest of the country is doing. But I think that Nova Scotia actually closed its small claims courts and then they reopened it at some point. Uh, so I don't know if that's changed. Again, here is a uh, an information section uh, form, fillable form, that uh, I speed through here. 
and this is all just just random random details to move on to the next page just to get <clears throat> just to show you what it looks like so again who is the claimant who is the defendant who is the represented representatives counsel i'm an individual person i'm a business all these details have to be laid out in in the form that is provided by the court. And uh, now we're going to move on to the next stage of the form, which is check one or more of, of the following to indicate the remedy you are seeking. So you can click all of them if you want, or you can just click on damages. And right here is where you're listing out your damages, it can't be more than $100. Nope, can't happen if you're seeking 19 grand in general damages. Nope, not happening. You can only seek 100 damages in Nova Scotia, which is, I, I just think it's ludicrous. I, I, I can't imagine how little lawsuits are happening in Nova Scotia. Nobody wants to get damaged in Nova Scotia. Uh, and I guess that's, you know, a deterrent, perhaps, in, in using the courts. Um, you know, if you can't, you know, claim anything greater than $100, you're going into a superior court or a queen's court or a supreme court um, for, for general damages over $100. That is the reality of what this leaves you if you're in Nova Scotia. So... In summary, what are you going to be putting in your paragraphs? Who is the plaintiff? Paragraph one. Who is the defendant? Paragraph two. Um, you could also put in paragraph one instead of who the plaintiff is. You can put, you know, what you're claiming and the specifics. That is when you're creating that schedule A and you're attaching it as a separate document. Um, you know, I claim $10,000 in general damages. $2,000 in special damages. And again, special damages, general damages, very different. You need to know the difference when you fill out your claim. The following paragraphs, after you list who the parties are in this section, you're going to list the date and time something happened. From the uh, first incident, the furthest incident away from the present moment in the uh, highest or the lowest sequential numbered paragraph to the most recent event in the last few paragraphs that you're going to write. <clears throat> you can plead law, but don't plead evidence unless it's okay with the rules and unless it's absolutely necessary. Don't plead evidence in your pleadings. You just don't. Only include relevant information. Have it be short, succinct sentences. You're telling a story. Don't use legalese if you're a self-represented litigant. Use simple, basic sentences. Um, and this is your document where you make assertions uh, and you make allegations. You can even plead alternatively if the rules allow you to. And what is pleading alternatively? Um, the, back to my, uh, example about the dog owner, the dog owner, uh, negligently and or intentionally let go of the leash, releasing the dog. The and or portion is pleading alternatively. He either did this, he intentionally did it, or he negligently did it. And if you plead in the alternative, most rules say that you have to say that you're pleading alternatively if it's not obvious. Um, again, you have to read the rules to find out whether or not those rules apply to you. Don't forget to address how you arrived at your damages. Did you suffer mental anguish? Have you been getting treatment for your mental anguish? And how long is that mental anguish supposed to be going on for? Well, all those have to be laid out in your claim. What steps did you take to resolve this out of court? It always looks good on you if you're trying to be a reasonable person. Um, what steps also did you take 
to mitigate your damages. That is, what steps did you take to minimize your loss? Uh, you should list that out. I um, went to get a cast on my hand and uh, I'm to mitigate the long term, the long term suffering that I may go through. I'm going through physiotherapy to mitigate my damages. That's ongoing treatment that it's good to list in your <clears throat> good to list in your uh, claim. Here is the claim that we filled out. Obviously, some of this is gibberish here, but again, same thing, par uh, province to province. The paragraphs are laid out here in, in numbered sequential uh, chronological order, and it's, it's really good to just follow the instructions if there is a guide on that court's website. Whew! So, uh, I think we're going to go to PEI here, and then we're going to go to none of it. Uh, again, you're going to find that these are all basically the same province to province. Here in PEI, we're calling it a plaintiff's claim, Form 7A. It's exactly what it's called in Ontario. Uh, but, you know, it's going to look a little bit different. You know, how you fill in the form, it's going to look a little bit different than, you know, without a box around it. You know, the name of the parties without a box around it or without a form box. Again, you're going to need to check off what type of claim you're issuing. The rules may say that you can only bring one type of claim. So make sure that you get your butt covered by going to the rules and figuring out what is allowable and what is not allowable when it comes to these documents. Up to none of it, uh, I believe this is the last province or territory we're gonna take a look at. They have a helpful small claims court guide. Take a look at the guide. Um, here's the notice of claim. Again, it looks almost identical to what you're finding in other provinces. You know, a space at the top for the plaintiff, a space at the top for the defendant. What language should it be held in? Uh, are you abandoning amount, an amount over 20,000? Because you can only sue for 20,000, apparently, in none of it. Um, does the defendant understand the language of this claim? That is a question that I haven't seen on many forms before. Um, and then instructions to the defendant. Again, again, I can't reinforce enough C Schedule A. If this video is called anything, it should be called C Schedule A, but it's not going to be because you won't be able to find it if you if I put that. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you have questions, comments, please put them below. Obviously, I can't reiterate or I can't explain it enough to go and look at your rules in the province that you reside in or the territory that you reside in because most of you are not living in Canada that are going to be viewing this video, unfortunately.